Check this out. I hope it fits on the table. Uh oh, I might be in trouble. Ah, look at that. I don't know what this is for. Wow. We are gonna make raisins with this gadget. But first, we need some raisins. And to do that, we need some grapes. So, let's go get some. Whoops. I am here at my neighbor's fruit farm and they have fantastic little vineyard here that I'm going to pick some grapes. So let's get to it. My neighbor has been retired from fruit farming for a few years and even though weeds are trying to take over, the vines are still producing beautifully. Look at all those grapes. So I picked several seedless varieties, the Reliance, the Canadice, and the Concord seedless. All very tasty varieties because I wanted to try my hand at drying them. Unfortunately, these varieties were pretty much past ripe and some were even drying on the vine. I wasn't able to get video, but I put those babies ASAP into the dehydrator and here they are. I thought they turned out pretty good. They're probably a little over dry and because some of them got a little crunchy, mm, but they are so good. I've eaten quite a few already. I do have some in a jar. These are the Concords. And you can see they're a little bit darker than the Reliance because the Reliance were whiter. And these did get a little crunchy. <laughs> but they're still delicious. Mmm. Mmm. Oh my god. <laughs> they're so good. Mmm. I think the reason that these taste so much better than ones you can buy in the store is because the ones in the store do have oil. This one says sunflower oil, probably as sort of a preservative, Pre yeah. preservative, <laughs> and also to help them not stick together and maybe to help them stay a little moist too. We also have to remember these are a different variety than these, so these will taste a little different, but they're still so delicious. Also, remember that we can easily buy seedless raisins in the store. But did you know that up until the early 20th century, our ancestors only had raisins with the seeds in them and they had to get the seeds out using this gadget. These raisins are already seedless. I need some raisins with seeds. So we need to go back to the orchard. Let's go. Here I'm picking regular Concord grapes and White Niagara. While I was picking, my neighbor came out and told me that his great-grandfather who built this homestead in the mid-1800s had at least eight to ten acres of grapes and in an old diary it told of him taking his crop by wagon to Buffalo, New York to be sold there and shipped out. What a cool legacy that he was able to grow grapes just as his ancestor did and they are tasty. I am back in the kitchen and I am ready to get these sweet things dried. I went ahead and washed the grapes, but I left them on the stems and clusters because I'm going to try drying these several ways. Several of the 19th century cookbooks that I read talked about drying these in several different ways. Oh, and speaking of cookbooks, I will put a link down below to a website where I found a bevy of 18th, 19th, and 20th century cookbooks. They're fantastic. Some of the cookbooks talked about drying the grapes right on the clusters, and some of them said to take them off. I'm going to try both ways. They also talked about using evaporators, which would be very much like our modern day dehydrator. And I'm going to use my dehydrator, but I'm also going to be using my reproduction Elmira Stoveworks stove. 
But first, I need to get these off the stems. So, while we're doing that, we're going to have what I call... It's high story time! Hi, story time will be a regular feature here on History Treehouse, where we'll talk about the history of things. We may even have some nostalgic memories thrown in for good measure. So, let's start with a little history of the grape. About the year 1000, a Norse Viking named Leif Erikson named the area of North America in which he landed Vinland or Vineland because of all the wild grape vines growing so abundantly. Fast forward to the year 1616. Lord Delaware wrote to the London Company suggesting and urging the growing of grapes in Virginia as a source of revenue for the new colony. Now, over the years, colonists were at times required by law to grow grapes and also rewarded for doing so. They even sent Frenchmen over who were experts in growing grapes, as well as cuttings from European varieties to graft with the native kind. We do know that after many failures, they eventually succeeded and exported wine to Europe. And by the end of 1830, the Catawba and the Isabella were the two main grapes grown in eastern the U.S. Ah, but we all know about the Concord grape, don't we? Enter cool dude Ephraim Bull of, wait for it, Concord, Massachusetts. Hmm, I wonder if there's a connection. So this guy works for years, eventually developing the Concord grape in the 1840s, which if you are alive, you've had in jams, jellies, or grape juice. Not far from me is Naples, New York, where the famous grape pies are made from Concord grapes. You have to buy a grape pie if you are ever near there. I promise they are delicious. But get this, this poor guy, Mr. Bull, is basically cheated out of his discovery and dies nearly penniless. His grave even says on it, he sowed, others reaped. If you think of the gazillions of products made from Concord grapes over the years, oh, wow. By the way, the house that he lived in and vines that came from the original vine are apparently still there in Concord. Pretty cool. When I was growing up, my father used old swing sets put together in a big arbor that we could walk through. It was fantastic, and Concord grapes were growing everywhere all over it. You could walk through and just pick the grapes off and eat them. Oh, it was so much fun for a kid. Every year, my mother spent days and days making and canning grape juice. The whole house would smell divine. Then in the middle of winter, when it was so cold outside, she would get out a jar of that delicious grape juice, mix it with some water and some sugar, and then she would make some popcorn. And we would have grape juice and popcorn on a Saturday night and watch Lassie. Mm. Do you have a good memory like that? Put it in the comments below. Let me know. All right, the grapes are off and they are on our sheets ready to go into the dehydrator and into the oven. I didn't have a really good rack to put in my pan so I just have an old broil pan flipped upside down and I put the grapes on that hoping that that will let a little air circulation go in there. My oven goes around 140 to 170 at the lowest so we'll see how this goes and I'll be back when the grapes are dry. I am back. We have dried raisins with the seeds in them. The cookbooks talked about drying the seeds on a wood stove. I don't have a wood stove. You would put them somewhere on the wood stove where it was you know, a warm heat and that would help dry the raisins. The cookbooks also talk about drying them in the sun. I am in western New York State. We do not have sun at this time of year. They also talked about building frames that you would hang from the ceiling and put over a wood stove or a pie, maybe in an attic. Again, I do not have a wood stove. So we had to do it in the oven and 
in my dehydrator and you can see that I have an Excalibur. I don't know the model. Yes, I do. It's a 3000 series. That's what it says on the back here. I love my dehydrator. It does a great job. I will show you what the grapes look like when they got dried in the dehydrator. These are the Concords. You can compare these with these. These were the Concords laid out before. I also dried them on the stem, which is quite interesting because look at that. They're like, you can pull them right off the stem, but when you break them off, it's kind of like some of the stem comes with it. So I don't know if I would do that again. It's kind of stuck because of the sugar. <laughs> They're hard to get off. <laughs> Now you'll notice, look at look at these. These are the, the white Niagara's, but they're dark. But check this out. Where are they? Here they are. Check that out. These dried very light and they still look they still look like golden raisins. But yet when I dried them in the oven, they dried like this. And I did read in some cookbooks that it depends on how you dry them. They may dry a lighter color depending on the temperature or the environment. These definitely dried dark even though they're the same thing as this. So let's see if we can get this thing to work and take the seeds out of these raisins and have seedless raisins. I've got my raisins all ready to go and I got my raisin de-seeder or raisin seeder. That's what it's called. Here is a cool, I guess this was either an advertisement or it was the actual label that was on the box. We also have instructions. Some of these things crack me up what they said about this. Avoid appendicitis. Easily adjusted and cleaned. The only good seeder. Removes every seed without waste. Seeding raisins a pleasure since the introduction of this marvelous little device. And the coup de resistance. A child can operate it. I should be able to do this. Now, we have the instructions here, and it says, after fastening the cedar to the table, which I have a little problem because my table is like that thick, and I don't have that much room to put it in. So we're going to have to figure out something. So give me a second. I'll be right back. Let's take a closer look at the cedar. As you can see, there is a handle that turns a shaft and one shaft has a rubber roller and that roller has a chute underneath where the seeds come out. On the back shaft there are thin serrated metal discs each with a triangular piece that keeps the discs in place. On the inside the metal discs and the roller meet up and you can see that these metal discs eventually press against that rubber roller, which is what causes the seeds to be pushed out of the raisins. The rubber roller is adjusted by a thumb screw on the front, and you can see here that the rubber roller is moving freely, but then when I adjust the thumb screw tight against the front of the cedar, the rubber roller now stays in place and causes the tension so that the seeds can be pushed through. And as the handle is turned and the seeds are put in and forced through, the seeds are forced out of the raisins. And that is how the cedar works. One funny thing is that on the side of the cedar, it says, wet the raisins embossed directly in to the cedar. I thought this was quite humorous. They really want to make sure that you wet your raisins before you put them in. They don't want you to forget. Unfortunately, the instructions do not say how to wet the raisins. So, we'll just get a little cup of water and we'll see what happens. All right, I've got my water. I think I'm all set. Let's continue reading the instructions. It says, wet the raisins and feed into the hopper. The raisins sprinkled in only two or three at a time. So we'll wet the raisins. 
two or three at a time and put it in and whoop I guess it's not tight enough oh I heard a crunch oh it came out the raisin came out the wrong way there's a raisin stuck in there oops there's an, there's one I lost a raisin oh there it is on the bottom I don't see I lost the raisin again though. I can't find the raisins. I can't find the raisins. Oh, they're stuck right there. Maybe I don't have it tight enough. Oh, I got a bunch of raisins stuck in there. I need a knife. Okay, there must be a trick to this. Maybe I'll tighten it a little bit more. Wet the raisin and in you go. Nothing's happening. Enterprise Manufacturing Company. I don't know about your de -seeder. This ain't working so good. Of course, it could be that this thing is like 125 years old. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. All right, there's the raisin. I don't feel any seeds. Okay, now there's a seed in here. So let's try that one. Let's try and tighten this a little bit more, maybe. That's kind of gross, but I think it got the seed out. I don't know where the seeds are going, though. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at all the seeds. Check that out. Check it out. Oh my goodness. Do you see those? Wow. Look at that. Well, it's working, but this is a pain. Can you imagine your ancestors, your great great grandma doing this? Like, maybe I need to put it a little tighter again. Oh, that worked really good. Oh, that worked really good. I think I needed to tighten it a little bit more. Okay, it might be all trial and error. I think I've got it down. It is getting the seeds out, but it's not the easiest machine to work. And it kind of squishes the raisins, and they're a little bit different when they come out. So maybe I need to tighten it even a little bit more, perhaps. That one worked. It's taken out the seeds. It's working. So this is kind of a messy procedure. I tell you what, I would not want to have to do this way back in the day, trying to get all of these seeds out of these raisins. And I still haven't even made a dent in all the raisins that I have. I don't know if I want to keep going. It's leaving the raisins kind of wet. While I'm doing this, I want to tell you a little something about seedless raisins. There is a, another YouTube channel called Today I Found Out. Today I Found Out is hosted by Simon Whistler. Hmm, I wonder if Simon is related to Whistler's mother. Simon answers fantastic questions and they have one video that is called How Were Raisins Made Before Seedless Grapes? I'll put a link to that video below so you can watch it for yourself because it has a lot of fantastic information. For example, did you know that there were seedless grapes before we had seedless raisins? I found in the store some Zante currants, which are actually and I quote from the Sun Made Raisin Company, they are made from black Corinth grapes dried naturally in the sun to give them their unique tart flavor which makes them perfect for baking. I have never tried a currant by itself, so I'm a little curious. Oh, well, they're very tiny. They're definitely much smaller. And here are my seedless dried grapes that I did from my neighbor's vineyard. These are a little bit smaller than the Niagara and the dried Concord. actually taste like raisins. But in Simon's video, he talks about how the Corinth grape, which was seedless, was around for ages and ages. And they were making Zante currants from those Corinth grapes for many, many, many years. So they did have seedless grapes, but they were not something that was commercially grown in the United States. So enter William Thompson, who was a vineyard owner in California. And we know that in 1872, he sent to Rochester, New York for three cuttings. 
He planted those. One survived and it was a fantastic seedless variety that then spread to other vineyards and it eventually became called the Thompson Seedless. And of course, because it was big and plump and without seeds, unlike these, it was perfect for raisins. And that is how the Thompson seedless raisins spread and became popular so that people didn't have to do this. Enter a guy named Dan Russell. Dan Russell has a blog called Search Research. I'll put a link below. Dan researched where did seedless grapes come from? And of course he got the information as well about Thompson and how he sent to Rochester, New York for those cuttings. The problem is, is that there are several places online that say Thompson got his cuttings from a company in Rochester called Elmira and Barry, and it was spelled with an A. And there is an Elmira, New York, which is spelled with an E. Dan Russell said, hmm, I used to live near Rochester, New York. I know that there used to be a nursery there that was very popular in the 1800s, but it wasn't called Elmira and Barry. So Dan turned to Google Books. Dan found a book called A Practical Treatise on the Raisin Grapes, Their History, Culture, and Curing. That is quite a mouthful. <laughs> Dan found out in that book, which was published in San Francisco in 1890, that there was some information that helped him review the clues that he knew were missing. Here's what it said. Thompson Seedless. This variety has been growing in California for many years. It was imported from Rochester, New York from the establishment of Elwanger and Berry about 1872 and was by them described as a grape from Constantinople under the name of Lady D. Coverley. Thompson Seedless is the name given this grape by the local growers around Yuba City and not the original name. Yes, the name of the nursery was Elwanger and Berry Nursery Company, not Elmira, or as Simon Whistler pronounces it, Elmira. <laughs> so, when you find information on your family, don't believe the very first bit of information that you find. Always double check, triple check, find those primary resources, and make sure that you've got the right information. Object lesson time! Do you feel just like the raisins? You feel like there's so much pressure all around you? Just like the raisins going through this machine, feeling pressured on every side, because it truly does squeeze it from all different angles. And our lives can be like that. Sometimes we have pressures in life that just seem unbearable, and you feel like nothing good can come of it. But God is actually looking down and seeing that those pressures are going to change you from a raisin that has nasty, unusable seeds inside it to a raisin that is going to be able to be used for good. And all of those nasty seeds are going to come out. And he allows that to happen so that he can use you in good ways. And we don't know what the end is. We just feel the pressures all around us. But trust God that he knows what he's doing, that he can see the end result. Just like I can see the seeds and the useful raisins coming out of this gadget. And if you allow God to get the nasty seeds out, he can use you. And as you research your ancestors, remember that you are a true treasure in your family tree. And I'll see you soon. <laughs>